I just arrived in Hong Kong. I am completely fried, but I wanted to make a quick vlog about why you need to read this book, The Sellout by Paul Beatty, which won the Man Booker Prize last year. Here's the first line of The Sellout. This may be hard to believe coming from a black man, but I've never stolen anything. If that doesn't pique your interest, you should probably stop watching this vlog now. This book has a labyrinthine multi-layered plot. Therefore, I'm going to drastically condense it and just say that it's about a young black man named me who's grown up in the blackest, poorest neighborhood of L.A. called Dickens where he seeks to resegregate the school system and becomes a slave owner, landing him in front of the Supreme Court after five years. In fact, the absurd plot is merely a pretext for Paul Beatty to serve up a tsunami of observation about American culture and race relations. It's important to add one caveat against this backdrop of encomium. If you're looking for a novel which is configured in a traditional format of beginning, middle, and end. The sellout doesn't follow that, and it may be a bit hard going because more than a plot line, Beatty describes a series of circumstances. And that's noticeable about one third of the way into the book when the momentum changes from seemingly plot driven to more of a meandering stream of consciousness. Now I personally didn't find that to be a problem because the prose was enough to propel me forward to the conclusion of the book. The main reason to read the book is because it's a brilliantly written book. You usually will never come across an author who's able to braid together urban black vernacular with the most high-flown literary flair. It's not just brilliant, it's also fascinating that these two traditions can live cheek by, by jowl with each other and be such intimate and appropriate bedfellows. I think it's by dint of his genius that he can actually pull off this unbelievable high wire act. So that's the number one reason to read the book. The second reason to read the book is because it dares to broach certain topics and issues which have been considered verboten in polite society at dinner tables across America for the last 20 years among politically correct liberal progressive people. And that is incredibly refreshing and there couldn't be a more pressing time to administer or to pour that cold bucket of water on our heads. Now, Paul Beatty doesn't do this in a negative, destructive way. He upends sacred cows left, right, and center, and sometimes it feels mischievous, sometimes it feels perverse, sometimes it feels arbitrary. It doesn't really matter. It's the act of upending them, the act of using absurdity and humor to encourage us to look afresh uh, issues which have become fossilized almost in the historical record about how we are supposed to think about them. He shows us that that's, it's silly, flies in the face of common sense, and at the very worst is hypocritical bullshit. I was so blown away by this book, I actually Googled Paul Beatty and watched a bunch of his interviews. I wanted to make sure that I walked away from the book with the right takeaway, which is very me. And it all crystallized for, for me when I watched a BBC interview where he was able to choose his favorite passage to read. And this is the passage that he chose. Black people don't even talk about race. Nothing's attributable to color anymore. It's all mitigating circumstances. The only people discussing race with any insight and courage are loud middle-aged white men who romanticize the Kennedys and Motown 
And well-read, open-minded white kids like the tie-dyed familiar sitting next to me in the free Tibetan Boba Fett t-shirt. A few freelance journalists in Detroit and the American hikikomori who sit in their basements pounding away at their keyboards composing measured and well thought out responses to the endless torrent of racist online commentary. When I saw that he had read that passage, I finally got it and the big light bulb went off in my head. How can anyone speak for somebody else and presume to know how they should feel, how they should characterize their own Racial, racial and political history, their formation, their most important cultural totems and references. And he makes this point by taking a laughing sledgehammer to s certain sacred cows, by making his protagonist a champion, a latter-day champion for segregation, for resegregation, and, 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 and even worse or better, as you may see it, makes him a modern-day slave owner. Who's to say what Paul Beatty is allowed to think or not? And that's the whole point. Now think about it. I'm Chinese. I'm talking about a black author who's writing about slavery and segregation and bringing it back. What I want a lot of white people or a lot of black people telling me how I should feel as an Asian American having grown up in Cincinnati, Ohio, just as I can't expect my extremely white husband to understand what prejudice feels like firsthand, and he certainly doesn't because he tells me that he can't believe I was discriminated against growing up in Cincinnati, Ohio as a teenager. And that obviously, that makes me quietly furious, but I've, I just gloss over it. Just as he can't relate to that, it doesn't mean that he's any better positioned as a white person, and I'm just lumping you all together, white people. It doesn't mean that a white person can assume any part of my narrative. There is no way that a white person, or for that matter, a yellow, red, brown, dust-colored person can decide for a black person what is cathartic, redemptive, healing, just to remedy discrimination. By having me choose to pursue the most extremely absurd form of redress and rectification for his so-called harm, slavery, and segregation. Beatty makes that point with searing, unforgettable black humor. He's not a messianic person, Paul Beatty, clearly not. He's not a messianic guy. That's, that much is clear. Um, but something has rankled him and it has led to this book. That's the fundamental thing that's been rankling. And, and it squares with everything that Paul Beatty said. He refuses, he's very diffident in most of his interviews. What comes through loud and clear is that we are composed of a kaleidoscopic mosaic of beliefs, preferences, formative experiences, none of which is going to fall within a canonical monolithic worldview simply because we're part of a category as simplistic as a race, a nationality, or and ethnicity. It's not something where you can say, okay, I'm putting that little conclusion in my pocket and I can now put it in a drawer safely for the rest of my days. The book is important because it just kind of slaps you around and wakes you up and makes you think about all these, these received, the, the received wisdom of the post-civil rights era. This book is weirdly prescient because had we not been so wedded to our knee-jerk liberal reactions and saying endless kumbayas about all the received liberal pieties, this is the expression that all the critics use, liberal pieties are an excellent 
expression in this context. If we were not continuously congratulating each other for holding, uh, holding the right beliefs, the, the correct political convictions and being endlessly politically correct, we would not be suffering the political fate that we find ourselves in today. People have basically ceased to investigate, question, and um, talk out loud about all of the assumptions underpinning our beliefs and political convictions, and we're just taking it on faith that, okay, here's the agenda. If I basically just tick all the boxes on the left or the right side, I'm set. We need to be much less superficial about our views, and that everybody needs wide berth to own their own, to own and express and act by their own views. There is no monolithic truth, especially in today's day and age. The most important thing is to understand, is to actually identify what we truly believe in and fight for and champion that. That's more important than anything else. I've never worked so hard on a vlog and that I underwent innumerable intellectual gyrations before coming away with the crystallizing epiphany that a white person can't stand in the shoes of a black person and vice versa. A very simple but powerful conclusion, which, because it's wrapped in a multi-tiered, multi-layered, elaborate Japanese gift box, isn't obvious. The second thing I wanted to say was I looked at what literary criticism and reviews were out there and they were authored almost exclusively by white critics. And it's easy enough to say this book shatters sacred cows and it's a satire. That's, that much is extremely obvious. I think that that's the maximum extent of a conclusion that can be reached by a mere observer who's never experienced most of the experiences that Paul Beatty is describing, satirical or not. And therefore, I'm very glad that I decided to invest a lot of personal energy in recording this vlog.